Bienvenue à la session scientifique du département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa. La session se veut bilingue. Vous êtes invité à poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Bonne session! Cette présentation sera enregistrée et est disponible sur la chaîne YouTube du département de médecine familiale. En poursuivant la session, vous consentez à être enregistré si votre caméra ou microphone est activé. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Department of Family Medicine YouTube channel. By continuing the session, you are consenting to be recorded if your camera or microphone is activated. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui à partir de nombreux endroits différents et dans un espace virtuel. Mais nous désirons commencer par reconnaître les terres sur lesquelles se trouve le département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa, qui font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple Anishinaabe algonquin. Nous vous invitons à réfléchir à votre propre emplacement au Canada par rapport au territoire où vous vous trouvez aujourd'hui. Nous reconnaissons aussi les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Akonongum egawikad ki migwewaj. Nimanajianig kakina anishnabeg undaje kaye ogog kakina eneagizijig ene kukamikak kanadang eje udapinagig endawajin udawang. We are gathered today from many different locations and in a virtual space. But we wish to begin by recognizing the land on which the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa is located, which is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We invite you to think about your own location in Canada in relation to the territory where you find yourself today. We also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present and future. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, June edition of Family Medicine Grand Rounds. So it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce three speakers uh, from the uh, Winchester District Memorial Hospital. Um, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Mohammed Gazarin, who is the Chief Research Officer um, at the hospital in Winchester. Um, he's also founder of the Rural Research Network, a healthcare research collaborative involving five rural organizations. Dr. Gazarin and his colleagues work to address many important rural subjects, such as transition and care, medication reconciliation, research partnerships, residents retention, and mental health in youth. So without further ado, Mohammed, I'm going to turn things over to you. All right, so good morning, everyone. I'm really kind of excited uh, and happy to have this opportunity to share uh, our work at Winchester Hospital uh, Research Department. What I'm going to do over the next kind of 12 minutes is to give you a quick high level uh, updates and description about kind of the, our research program. Uh, so if you know about this, then you will know how our progress is. If you didn't hear about our research program, then you will get, you will get a chance to, to, to do it. And then two of my peers will give a deeper dive into uh, two of our research projects. I have no conflict of interest to declare. And uh, just something quickly to share is that during the presentation, you'll have samples of projects and names. So if you, if you are working together on a project and your name is there or the project is there, it's just due to the limited number of slides is not out of underestimating any project at all. So just samples of projects and names. Perfect. So this is a photo from the previous slides I used uh, three years ago when I first started, and I continue to use uh, during orientation of new employees. Uh, new employees. So uh, in the slides, I kind of highlighted and we, we shared kind of the three strategic priorities that we are going to focus on, and uh, uh, and that's what I'm going to how I'm going to structure my presentation today through the lens of the three strategic priorities. Uh, by the way, the presentation is available online under the journey to the top. And if you like to go there after I finish, after we finish the, the presentation for sure. And there are kind of three people here that I tell the, the team that once we climb this mountain, those kind of three Canadian pioneers will be happy with us. So if you would like to go there and guess the names of the three, 
if you get them right without Googling, if you get them right, just email me and I will uh, send you a gift voucher for this. So, uh, so, so just, just some excitement. Perfect. So the first strategic priority was kind of partnership and integration or in another simpler way is kind of building a structured network. So structured network is, is critical. And we agreed that we'll build it on two, two ways. One of them is kind of building a horizontal network. And the goal of this horizontal network is to help address one of the challenges we faced at the beginning and we continue to face in any uh, rural or small community hospital, which is the limited sample size. So, uh, so, and this created doubts at the beginning. Mohammed, we don't have enough sample size in terms of patients or physicians and, and, and everything. We have a very small sample size. Now with kind of with that, even in the world of mega data, it's just that auto hospital sample size sometimes can be small and need even larger and larger and so on. So that's why we identified, we said, okay, we are going to uh, create a structured horizontal network. And it started by just approaching kind of the hospitals, uh, uh, the alike hospitals, and with the goal of achieving that triple win aim, which is kind of win for us by now producing, uh, able to uh, produce more structured and powered research projects, went for them by having access to the infrastructure we created and went for the rural research agenda uh, nationally by producing more robust rural research. So it started with just approach, what do you think about this project? Let's work on it together and then evolved over time after we will start to see the fruits of, of this partnership to be what we are proud of called the Rural Research Network, which is a collaboration of rural organization that's focused on addressing issues affecting rural population. So the network has five organizations, three hospitals and two non-hospitals, Winchester, Aaron Pryor, Kenville, plus Gateway Center of Rural Excellence, and Godrich and, um, and kind of GW McIntosh, uh, or Williams Ringram Profit Corporation. So the fruits, that's the first question that comes, what are kind of the fruits of this kind of partnership? I will kind of proudly say that we have kind of three, three major fruits that came out of it. One of them is that establishment of the Rural Research Network Ethics Board. If you have peers in, in community or rural hospitals, ethics is, is a big challenge to, to them and, and to every one of us because you don't have ethics to approve. And many hospitals kind of override this through like research, uh, ethics, through kind of ethics committee, but then we, we realize that actually that is, that is not right and it's not acceptable, it's not even legal. So in the, in the ethics world, it has to be research ethics board, cannot be ethics committee, cannot be the same way we address ethics issues that we have in the hospital. It has to be through a very structured process uh, that's adhered to the TCPS kind of um, manual and standards. So we launched the, the REB in June 2019, and this is kind of a photo of the REB members. I am in the middle, so I created the REB or helped create it, but I'm not, I'm not kind of member of the REB. I just help, help support them if needed. And, and kind of uh, the team is just is growing, is, is able to, to, to uh, help with the challenges uh, we, we face in terms of ethics. And not just us, it's for the all members of the World Research Network. The second uh, beautiful fruit is that Transition in Care, the tech project, Transition in Care project, which we received funding. Uh, for $200,000, Dr. Brian Devin is gonna give the full details. He's the principal investigator of the study. And which uh, the beauty about the transition and care project, it helped address a chronic problem. For the longest time I have been working at Winchester, we know we have challenge at discharge. We know transition and care is a challenge to us and to every hospital. Uh, but the all evidence coming is around uh, transition and care in academic institutions, nothing around rural and community hospitals. And those are two different, two different kind of animals completely so that's why uh, we needed a project to help us kind of with this and one of the uh, exciting outcome of this is now we have a regular and structured collaboration through a monthly meeting where the leadership from the institutions and through the research team we discuss the progress of this project and how the hospitals we start to see how this collaboration we are able to see the advantage in each transitioning care bundle at each site and how can we bring it together and finally we are working on a to move this even uh, stronger and further and create a structure that can, we can share with others through a submission for partnership development grant that you are working on, on at the moment. On the second axis is the vertical networking and vertical networking through academic institutions to help us access 
the research engine to help us make sure that our research projects are uh, up to the standards that we, we want them to be. And this list here, as I mentioned, just sample of names. And, uh, and when we started, we only had like very limited number at the OHRI, it was only Dr. Tim Ramsey. From the URL, it was only the clear lady. Just kind of those are kind of the pioneers who kind of believed in what we what we are building and supported us at the early days. And now the list just kept growing and growing and growing. Those are, as I mentioned, just samples. We have more projects and more partnership with, with institutions. Uh, the same with Monfort Hospital through kind of Dr. Bill Hack and Dr. Johnson, uh, through the Oral Health Science Research uh, Network Research Ethics Board, Dr. Sagner which kind of was kind of the mentor for us during and continuing to be the mentor for our research ethics board. Uh, through this partnership as well, we signed clinic with Clinical Trials Ontario, which is kind of a big, a big step, something we never thought of. Not just we signed with them a partnership, but also we succeeded and get all our partners, horizontal partners to sign with them. So this way, any studies that are approved through CTO can easily be done and, and implemented at Winchester Hospital without having to have an extra step of approving through that uh, and another research ethics board. That the, was the first uh, strategic priority. The second one is capacity building. So as kind of Albert Einstein mentioned in his book, The World as I See It, is that nothing truly valuable can be achieved by the unselfish cooperation of many individuals. And, uh, and just to give like a, a taste of this, all what we are doing, I can simply say that we have, I think we have like 50% discount or 70% discount through the support of all those individuals, internal uh, champions and internal pioneers at the hospital. And as you see in the photo, you see everyone from, from Winchester is collaborating and contributing to the success of our research program. You have here the, the CEO of the hospital uh, until to the youngest nurse and youngest employees. So we have in this photo is that a different, a different people, nursing, administration, physicians, everyone is contributing to, to the success of this to the degree that I can, I'm proud to say that we have a waiting list of people that would like to be part of research projects and, and uh, just, just there is lack of kind of enough opportunities uh, to just to give them fully, fully involved. So the capacity building, not just internally, but also for, for external for our rural community, which is the vision we had from the beginning is that for this uh, research uh, department and program to support our rural environment. Students and, uh, and our rural areas don't have the same access to resources as the students living in urban areas. And here we'll share just one, one example of the many students that volunteered with us. And Brett is a student from, from Campbell, volunteered with us uh, two years ago. And a few months ago, he got accepted into the med school. So, and he was kind of so proud of this and felt that his, his time with us and actually, he he contributed significantly to the uh, to the work of the of the creation of the REB in 2019, and uh, so he felt that this was kind of a, a major part uh, that he had in his in his CV and during his interview. The third research priority is kind of uh, is is kind of research projects, or more or or in a more specific term, is just research agenda moving into research agenda. At the moment, we are still uh, in, in kind of in the in scattered mode. So, if you look on our website, you have a different research projects in different areas. Uh, we are still kind of in the exploring phase, but we can feel we feel now that we are coming coming out of the exploring phase, and we feel now where where which projects we will we will are kind of focusing on and continuing on. So, in the next next part, I will simply share kind of the current sample of the current projects and sample of the completed projects. Uh, the first project I will start with, which is kind of project project to address uh, vaccine hesitancy. Uh, this project is kind of just got funded and it's kind of partnership with the leadership of Dr. Sharon Johnston and, and uh, Bill Hug. As kind of, they are kind of the, the main, main uh, investigator and leaders of the study, we are partners in it. And this project, as I think we discussed in the previous meeting, uh, got $500,000 grant from the Public Health Agency of Canada and through utilizing the CPIN platform. It's kind of cluster randomized control study. And this, this project is so cool and so important during this time. It works through three things. That's how it supports the family practice and the family physician. Number one, to assess them uh, and their kind of their patients and their teams to identify who in their practice have not been vaccinated. As we know, the hesitancy or resistance to vaccine has many different routes and causes. So this comes the second part, which is segment those patients. 
So this way we know which, uh, the, according to the age, according to the sex, rurality, education background, and then to move into the third step, which is that to help those practices uh, and uh, send digital messaging through this kind of segments of their, of their patients to address, uh, to address kind of that, that vaccine hesitancy and help bring it down. Definitely the project is way more than this. So you can go on the project website or you feel free to contact me or contact Dr. Hogg or Dr. Johnston. So uh, uh, also sample of the ongoing project is the Transition in Care Evaluation Rural Network Study, which is that will be discussed, the MyMetric project, the Partnership Development Grant, and, and many other projects. And complete, for completed project, just for the interest of time, you can go on our website and see kind of a, a, a full list of the projects and the publications and the posters and where kind of each, each kind of project have been kind of published and submitted for. With this, I will end, I will end my presentation. I think, I hope I am on time. So, uh, and uh, here you have my cell phone, you have my office number and my email. So I'll be more than happy to answer uh, any, any questions you have and to share any, any opportunities or anything I can, I can help and support with. Thank you so much. Okay, floor is open for questions. Um, my question that I have for you, and I, well, actually there's two things. One comment is um, the, the Department of Family Medicine in terms of the strategic plan has included uh, rural um, networks and rural research in it as an area of focus. So you, you, we should meet about that in terms of additional resources. Um, and then the second thing is I'm curious in terms of the, um, uh, you know, what, what were the, the sort of the two things that you really had to overcome in terms of trying to connect the um, variety of rural hospitals? Where did you get hesitancy um, from, uh, from folks and how did you overcome that? Okay, so that, that's an excellent question. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lady. So, uh, so the, the hesit I will start with the first one regarding kind of the, the rural opportunity. I will be more than happy. So uh, I, I, I see now living in 13 years in, in rural uh, community, I, I see the needs and see how can they contribute and what they have. So the hesitancy is that research means different things to different people. So like when you say research, uh, many, many of even our, our team members will think of randomized control study and will think of academic writing and those complexities they have. So this was, the, was, this was kind of the first thing is just how, how, how can you explain research in a simple way to them? So this way they know that it's not gonna be overwhelming. It's not gonna drain resources. It's just will we'll initially take some resources, but then it will be a door for lots of opportunities. So, uh, so that's, that was number one. Another key point for, for addressing this challenge was that uh, QI, like, like inserting QI in the message. So when I first kind of shared with them, it wasn't about, it was, I will say 70% QI and 30% research. So when you see QI, because now there is kind of Q, quality improvement plans that they have submit to the ministry, then when they hear the QI message and we are gonna share with them the resources and support them in their QI, QI is not easy in, in many people. And many hospitals, when they do QI, they feel, yeah, we do it, but it's, that's not the best satisfactory way to them. So I think using the QI message and how can we support the QI play the critical role. Thanks, Mohammed. That was really um, interesting and inspiring. Um, I had, I actually had a couple of questions. I'll, I'll ask very quickly, and you can choose which one to answer. I was wondering whether uh, you had uh, done any work with francophone minority francophone populations, because they're usually underserved and and in rural areas as well. So I wonder if any of the projects had touched upon that, and, I, and also about your uh, experience with patient partners in rural areas. So th thank you so much, Tatia. Uh, so, uh, so two things for for francophone. That's an excellent point. It's one of our uh, uh, areas of improvement that we are currently working with with Bell Hug out of Montfort on on addressing it. So, in the last meeting, kind of a few months ago, with kind of uh, with with Bill, he kind of identified this this need, and I admitted that we have weakness in it. Uh, uh, hopefully, over the coming months, we'll be able to to contribute something to it. But at the moment, no. If you are aware of any opportunity or anything we can help with, we'll be definitely more than happy. Uh, so that's that's regarding the, the francophone. And what was the other question, sorry? Um, patient partners. Uh, patient partners, we are good. I think we are very good with the patient involvement. And in, in all of our uh, 
projects that are kind of patients, uh, people at Winchester, they are kind of, they feel ownership in the hospital. So, and they contribute significantly. So uh, the patient involvement, and uh, I think we are doing very well. Uh, pretty much in every research project we have, there's kind of patient, uh, patient representation in it. Thanks, and I'd love to connect with you about the francophone studies. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sadie. Yeah, the, the francophony piece is an interesting one. The historic catchment for the hospital, um, if you look at this this area of SDNG, our uh, our primary language francophone population is less than three percent. Um, that being said, the overall catchment for the hospital as it continues to grow. One of the areas of significant growth is to the north and east, which is much more significantly francophone. Um, so the hospital has been gradually evolving. I've been here a long time now. Uh, it's been gradually evolving as we as we continue to grow in terms of our catchment in that area. So it's uh, it's it hasn't been an area of focus, but I think it's gradually increasing in terms of numbers. Um, it's with great pleasure now that I get to introduce our second speaker, and that is Dr. Brian Devon. And Brian is the Chief of Staff at the Winchester District Memorial Hospital. He's a lecturer with uh, the DFM and maintains a community family medicine clinic. His hospital work includes inpatient care, surgical assisting, and emergency department shifts. He's a valuable member of the research team, having been involved in many projects and is currently the principal investigator for the Transition and Care Evaluations Rural Network Studies. So Brian, on to you. Thanks, Doug. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to present a, uh, an overview of the, uh, the Transitions and Care Project. It's, uh, I appreciate the invitation and uh, I appreciate Mohammed asking me to uh, give you a, a look into what we're doing on it. It's, it's a long name for a straightforward project. Um, as as Mohammed mentioned in his overview of our, uh, our entire research activity at the hospital, um, one of, one of the things that's been identified, and I think it's, it's well recognized in particularly in primary care healthcare, um, is there's a significant amount of risk in transitions of care, whether that's internally within facilities and particularly between providers. So this, this research project has been uh, funded by a grant from PSI, which we're very appreciative of. The background to it, as I mentioned, is we know that transitions in care create risk. Anytime there's a handoff in healthcare of, of really any type, um, there's a risk for miscommunication, there's a risk for misinterpretation. Um, and a provincial report from a number of few years ago now um, identified particularly transitions at the time of discharge um, create a significant source of dissatisfaction, a significant source of negative consequences and risk. Um, and as a result of that, it creates uh, often a, uh, a requirement to uh, duplicate or to redo um, investigations that increases your risk of bounce backs for patients coming back to hospital. Um, there is not a great deal of literature in terms of looking at transitions, particularly in rural areas. Um, and even as a subgroup within that, looking at older adults in rural areas, we have a number of unique challenges um, partly due to the environment, um, you know, low population density, geographic dispersion. Uh, there's a relative scarcity of resource accessibility, certainly compared with urban areas. Um, and looking at least in this part of the province, there are some socioeconomic stressors as well. Um, the, you know, the, the, the back of the envelope description for rural, particularly rural Eastern Ontario, but I think rural Canada in general, is it tends to be older and poorer and have worse health outcomes than our urban neighbors. So the hospital has partnered with Arn Prior and District Memorial Hospital and Kempfield District Hospital to look at how we currently do transitions in care, particularly around discharge. Um, can we bring best practices together to improve our outcomes in that, and then can we disseminate that some of that best practice information not only to the partner hospitals but to the uh, to the broader rural primary care community? So, as mentioned, there's four. We have four aims to the project. First of all, identifying, you know, what what are the outcomes? What do we do well? What can we do better? 
Um, and one of the things we've identified already anecdotally, and we're acquiring the data to build a case around it, is you know, all healthcare facilities have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. So there are some things that each of our partner hospitals do very well. And there are other things where we have some opportunity for change or improvement. So we're looking at evaluating the quality of implementation of those transitions and care bundles. What we're hoping to do is bundle together the best practices, implement that at least at the local level, um, and determine whether that improves patient satisfaction and ultimately improves patient outcomes. And then, as I mentioned, hopefully share those results back with, uh, with other community partners. So it's an ambitious project for small hospitals. There's multiple phases to it. Um, we currently are near the completion of phase one. We've done the initial um, acquisition of hospitals, current transition activities. Um, and we're in the process of completing the more formal questionnaire to acquire data for what some of the uh, specific items of inquiry are in terms of uh, patient, particularly around patient communication at the time of discharge. Once that's done, then as I mentioned, we'll bring it back together, see if we can come up with a harmonized bundle that'll be a benefit to all of us. So qualitative evaluation is where we're at now, looking at uh, data gathering. Um, and it's for quite broad based. We're gathering data and Emily is, has been absolutely central and critical to this in terms of spearheading this and doing a very significant amount of the on the ground work for it in terms of acquiring the qualitative data. Um, some of it we're able to abstract out of hospital records, but a fair bit of it involves um, interviewing with internal external stakeholders um, and in particular interviews with uh, patients to see what their discharge and post discharge experience has been. As again, for outcome evaluation, we're looking at uh, some of these are measurables that can be acquired through current data resources, uh, KIHI, our hospital readmission rate records, et cetera. Um, and some of it will be more qualitative data acquired from patients and families um, and from community primary care um, members after discharge to see how it's all gone. We're gonna harmonize the bundles and come up with best practices and then come back a little further post implementation and repeat the evaluations so that we have a comparator data set to see uh, whether improving the uh, improving the transitions and care bundles and trying to implement best practices whether that actually makes a difference for patients discharging back into the community or not we're hopeful that it will um, and if we identify best practices that have a positive impact in terms of patient outcomes and resource use, um, then we'll disseminate those results. So the plan for dissemination is again, looking at it from multiple sources and gradually growing the dissemination plan. So initially it'll be internal among the partners, followed by launching a, a website and uh, creating an open source repository folder and a toolkit for people to be able to customize best practices. One of the things we've, we've learned at Winchester over many years is it's great to be able to stand on the shoulders of giants. So for years at the hospital here, we, uh, our colloquial term is we Winchester size stuff. It's great to have our large tertiary partners, the Ottawa Hospital, uh, the Heart Institute in particular, we draw on things as well from Mofor and Queensway, taking advantage of those enhanced resource opportunities. There's a lot of work that gets done to develop best practices, order sets, um, things like that. And we've become fairly adept as a smaller hospital at taking those in, analyzing them and saying, okay, how does this apply to our environment, our hospital um, and our patient population, customizing those sets of documents um, and uh, pro processes and protocols, and then rolling them out customized to our environment. We're hopeful that the, uh, the toolkit will be able to do do the same thing to other primary care institutions. So our experience here in Winchester is you know, quite different than the population dynamics and the physician population and the community dynamics, say in a place like Deep River or in Barry's Bay, 
so hopefully what we'll be able to do is say these are the best practices and then to have people be able to customize those for their environments. We're optimistic that this will be important enough information that it'll be worth sharing broadly and we'll be able to present at multiple multiple levels to be able to share that information. Um, first off between the hospitals in the two LINs that are participating, although LINs don't technically exist anymore, but everybody still thinks of it that way. Um, and then obviously disseminating that on a broader basis and moving towards publication. We're gradually moving into enhanced use of social media for both acquisition and distribution of information. And again, this is one of the opportunities we hope to leverage going forward. Brian, thanks so much. Uh, great initiative. I open the floor to questions. I'll actually start if you don't mind, Brian. Um, just wondering, this seems like it, it sets itself up very well for being ongoing. That, you know, what, what, once you've disseminated findings you, that you can sort of circle back and it's sort of like an emergent type uh, design. I, I think so. Um, it's, I'm still kind of growing into the whole concept of how research interfaces with clinical practice. And I think you're, I think you're bang on is there's an opportunity for this that we do, you know, do the foundational work, translate it into practice. And then what, I think that ongoing piece of being able to look and say, so how's this working? And I think more particularly in this, in our healthcare environment right now, as the healthcare environment evolves, I think there's going to be a necessity to involve, evolve those transitions as well. I'll jump in again. Thanks, uh, Brian. Fantastic work. I'm excited to see the um, results. Um, I think um, there's a lot uh, that you could already be writing about and sharing and in particular, most interested in how you essentially, as you said, looked at best practices and tools that were developed um, in an urban center and then did the uh, adaptation uh, for your rural context. So that would be a nice paper. Um, and it's would be highly relevant because again, I think, you know, I see it too. There's so much uh, duplication and silo. Um, and so what you've created here uh, with your network and just that approach is a real um, pearl that uh, should be shared for others. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a great experience to be working with multiple partners and people with Again, it's one of my first experiences with, with people with very focused expertise in uh, various areas of research. So looking, just as an example, looking at our initial qualitative survey, when we brainstormed on it, the initial survey had I don't know, 12 or 15 questions. Um, after having it reviewed and trialing it and testing it, we're down to about a half a dozen that we think that data is specific to the person we're asking the question to and can't be pulled from somewhere else, as opposed to things that are, you know, it's secondary. Well, here's what I heard. Here's what I think. That's less relevant. Um, they looked important initially, but once it gets reviewed, um, you know, wise people say, well, that's actually not something in somebody's area of uh, area span of control. So maybe we should ask things that are just relevant directly to them. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Shelby Allison. Uh, Shelby is a family medicine resident in her hometown of Winchester, and she's been involved in research since her first year of undergraduate studies and seems to have a project on the go ever since. Uh, her research interests have changed through the years from neuroscience to organic chemistry to bio nano nanomaterials and now to clinical research. Um, she's thankful for the opportunity to present her research, her residency research project uh, with all of us today. So uh, without further ado, Shelby, I'm going to hand things over to you. So good morning, everyone. Um, as did many other aspects of our lives, uh, the way in which family physicians were scheduled to provide inpatient care here at the Winchester Hospital underwent a significant change in response to the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in March of 2020. And I became curious about this and decided to structure my residency research project around it. As you can see, the title of my project is examining the impact of inpatient care model changes due to COVID-19. And I would like to thank my very supportive supervisors, Dr. Mohamed Gazarin and Dr. Jennifer Ingram Crooks. And once again, thanks for the opportunity to share my research with you this morning. 
Importantly, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose and we obtained full REB approval through the Rural Research Network Ethics Board for this project. I'd like to provide you with a bit of background. So Winchester is a rural community about an hour south of Ottawa. And we have a 25 bed medical surgical ward with four enhanced care unit beds. And the purpose of that ward is really aimed at caring for acute medical and surgical patients. We also have a 12 bed complex continuing care ward um, that provides longer term patients, uh, sorry, longer term care for patients who require more kind of rehabilitative and supportive care. Um, so prior to COVID, um, our community primary care providers would admit, manage, and then discharge their very own family practice patients from our hospital. Um, and this will be referred to as care model A going forward. In attempt to reduce the number of uh, community care providers that were flowing through our hospital on a daily basis in response to the pandemic, we decided to transition toward model B, which is the hospitalist model of care. So we had two hospitalists that would cover three to five day stretches, um, handing over to one another at the end of that period. Um, and they would admit and manage patients on both the med surge and complex care ward on an alternating basis. This brings me to the objectives of my work. Um, so we aimed to determine the impact of this care model change from A to B, from the physician, nurse, and patient perspectives. And we briefly looked at how length of stay and uh, effect on hospital budget was impacted by this change as well specifically in the setting of a rural Canadian hospital um, with the purpose to kind of guide our future care model here in Winchester and to better understand um, kind of what's best from all these different perspectives. So um, we looked to the literature because we needed a survey to administer to physicians and nurses. Um, and we found the physician work-life survey, which was developed and validated by William E.S. et al. Uh, the original survey was quite lengthy, but with um, both physician and nurse stakeholder input, we were able to modify um, and shorten this uh, survey tool to make it more relevant to our study and convenient for our respondents. And then kind of towards the end of this process, we thought it might be a great idea to gather patient uh, input as well. So we developed a very short survey for the purpose of this study. And once again, with nurse and physician input, we established face validity before its use. Um, so here is kind of our timeline, um, which I'll go into more on my next slide. So, our surveys were administered, as you can see at the top, at a single point in time after Care Model B was already established. So we asked physicians and nurses to think back to Care Model A and answer questions about different aspects of their work satisfaction on a scale to one to five. Um, we then asked them to think about working in Care Model B um, and repeated the same question um, and on the same five point Likert scale. This allowed us to determine whether answers improved, remained the same, or worsened with the transition to care model B. And rather than present kind of tables with numbers, I tried to represent this graphically for my presentation. So you can see answers that either improved or remained the same going towards model B are represented in green. And um, survey questions that worsened um, were, are represented in red. So we'll start by discussing the results of my physician survey. Um, we had a response rate of 100%, and we surveyed primary care providers who provided inpatient care during both Model A and then also um, worked as hospitalists in Model B so that we could gather the, the data we were interested in. Our first three questions focused on aspects of their overall practice. And as you can see, satisfaction was largely improved or unchanged going towards Model B. Importantly, I'd like to zoom in on this second question. So um, seven of the eight primary care providers surveyed found that Model B left them more time for their families um, with the remaining provider citing no change. And this finding has important implications with respect to physician recruitment and retention, um, which is an important factor in the sustainability of rural hospitals. And this is something that's found in other kind of similar work in the literature. 
Um, next, I'd like to zoom in on some interesting aspects rather than go through kind of each question in the interest of time. You'll see we have kind of med surge and complex care specific answers because these are such different environments. We wanted to capture these differences. Um, and you'll see that this survey prompt was negatively impacted by the change to model B. So in the complex care environment, physicians felt that there were too many physician to physician coverage changes. Um, and we'll talk more about this in the discussion about why this may be. Also um, relevant to what Dr. Devin was talking about previously, um, physicians were less confident discharging their patients from hospital um, in the hospitalist model. So we were no longer discharging Mrs. Jones back to our own family practice. Often we would kind of schedule her follow-up visit before she even left the hospital. And now we're kind of handing over to other providers. Um, so that's something that we found. And also physicians felt the overall quality of care they were able to provide was negatively impacted by the change specifically on the complex care unit. Next, moving to the, the results of my nurse survey, um, our response rate here was 22%. It was administered by SurveyMonkey, whereas our physician survey was administered over the phone. Um, and there were kind of a similar theme was noted by the nurses. So on complex care, they also felt there were too many physician to physician coverage changes in model B. And they also felt the overall quality of care they were able to provide was kind of negatively impacted by this change. On a more positive note, these three survey prompts focused on physician involvement in the interprofessional team. And in the med surge environment, there was an improvement noted by nurses. And I believe that this is because phys the hospitalist physician was now present on the ward throughout the day, as opposed to kind of coming to round in the early morning before heading off to their outpatient clinic. So they were there to be involved in the multidisciplinary meetings and things that take place. Lastly, we surveyed patients who were admitted under care model A between February 2019 and March 2020, and then had a readmission between March and November 2020 during care model B. Um, we did not um, survey patients who had a history of cognitive impairment, um, dementia, anything like that in the EMR. And the response rate for patient surveys was 44%. Oops, sorry. Um, and interestingly, patient satisfaction was overall unchanged. So the vast majority of patients um, did not really feel that there was any change in the quality of care they received um, comparing model A to model B. And also interestingly, most patients reported that they were contacted by their primary care provider for a post-discharge follow-up um, after their admission in model B, which suggests that this kind of communication between the hospitalist and their primary care provider was actually happening, which was um, very positive. This brings me to discuss some of the limitations to this project. So um, our sample sizes were not large enough to perform formal hypothesis uh, kind of testing on our results, but we were able to describe our results qualitatively. Um, our survey for model A was conducted after the change to model B because this kind of happened quite quickly in response to the pandemic. Um, but ideally we would have administered this survey prior to the change to model B. Our patient surveys were established for face validity before their use. So we didn't kind of perform the formal validity testing for our patient surveys, but we did wanna gather their input and we felt that that was important to do. And then obviously this change in, in the care model didn't happen in isolation. It happened in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So you can imagine there's been, as you all know very well, there's been so many other things happening, so many other stressors on our healthcare system. Um, so we do realize that there's other confounding variables and we tried to control for this or make up for this by asking people to report the things that they felt might have confounded their um, responses with qualitative question at the end of our survey. This brings me to our conclusion. So um, overall, this care model change to the hospitalist model seems to be quite positive in the context of our medical surgical ward. Um, however, we found that it does need work in our complex care setting. And this is because these patients tend to be quite medically complex with a variety of comorbidities and their lengths of stay tend to be quite long and often at multiple hospitals. 
which means there's lots of details that can get missed when patients, when they're being handed over kind of every three to five days, it takes a long time to get to know them well, um, which has actually helped us to kind of change the care model on complex care. So we now have a family physician covering this unit for month, a month at a time um, with handover to a hospitalist just for the weekend. Um, so hopefully that will help things and our patient satisfaction remain largely unchanged. So that concludes my, my project. And thank you again for this opportunity. And here are my references and my acknowledgements. I had a large team supporting me for this work. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. I think everybody's aware of this, but just in case you aren't, Shelby's study was selected as the top resident project uh, this year. So congratulations once again, Shelby. Thank you. And, uh, I open up the uh, the floor for questions and comments for Shelby. I'll jump in before Ed. <laughs> Fantastic work, Shelby. Congratulations again on uh, having the uh, top project. Um, I think um, what's what I'm interested in is clearly the work that you did then uh, led to a, um, a policy change or a, an actual real change in terms of now what the hospital was doing. Can you talk about how you shared your results that then um, and who, who you approached, I guess, to get uh, to make sure that the results then led to this uh, change in terms of the complex care? Yeah, sure. So. Um... At a small hospital like Winchester, um, and especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, things have changed in healthcare so quickly. Um, but so the chief of family medicine, the previous chief, so there's been a handover, but Dr. Jennifer Ingram Crooks was actually one of the supervisors on my project. Um, and that since become Dr. McEtitian. So um, at our family medicine meetings um, and also through email and seeing them on the ward, I was able to kind of update them on the results of, of what was happening. And we often talk about how things are going at our family medicine meetings too. So it was obvious to everyone that we, we needed a change in, in care model um, on complex care. And, um, and that was able to happen that way. So I guess just because we have such a tight knit group and it's quite small, we can communicate what we're working on quite easily here, which is great. Well, fantastic, because I think that's ultimately where researchers are trying to get to is that you do a study that shows um, some kind of important impact that then will in fact change practice. And uh, the fact that you've done this with your resident research project is hugely impressive. So well done. This gives me the opportunity to congratulate you that I didn't get a chance to at the uh, Rio Day, uh, Shelby. So like uh, Dr. Liddy, congratulations, really good work, very interesting, very timely and very useful and practical. So that's all the important aspects of um, this uh, elements of resident research that are brought, brought to the fore here. So that was wonderful. Um, I'm curious because I've seen some changes sort of in the works in the world of the hospitalist model at some of our local community hospitalists where they're moving away from the traditional um, family doctor with uh, privileges at the hospital to a purely hospitalist model. And do you think this form of research is, is starting to sound the death knell of the traditional, uh, uh, the traditional model? Or do you think there's still a role for the, uh, the, uh, uh, the traditional hospital, hospitalist who's also got a practice model in family practice? Or are you unwilling to venture your toe into that political uh, discussion? <laughs> well, actually, I was so surprised. So when I did kind of my literature review for this project, there's actually a huge body of research on this topic. Um, and this transition, as we all know, has been, it's kind of been well underway in larger centers for a long time. The shift kind of started in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and there's tons of studies at large academic institutions in both Canada and the US on kind of does the hospitalist save money? Do they provide more quality of, you know, higher quality of care, shorter lengths of stay, all of those things. Um, I, so I had a year of my residency where we would round on our own patients each morning. And um, I think there's, there is value in that. I mean, to see like, to see Mrs. Jones, you know what her baseline is. You've known her for years. You know that she's she kind of always walks with that limp. Um, she's always that short of breath um, compared to a hospitalist coming in as a one-off. They don't know the baseline. They don't know the context. They can learn it, but it's often quite time consuming to do so. Um, I, I 
I do think there is value to that model, but also being on call for your patients kind of 24 seven um, is not necessarily sustainable either. So I think there's definitely pros and cons to both model. I know I'm not answering your question directly, but you, you have, you have so answered that and I'm glad this has been recorded. So Maddie, <laughs> I want a copy of this later. So thank you. Thanks Shelby. That's it's a complex cool. question, but it, it's very interesting. Yeah. No, wonderful. That's great. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to put a, a local spin on it. Uh, besides congratulating Shelby on a, an amazing piece of work, the the change that she tested and gave us some hard data on is something that we had looked at as local physicians in a very anecdotal fashion. When we shifted, we had to shift really quickly. Mm -hmm. And those of us who have practiced for years and years and years in the quote, you know, quote unquote old model, the traditional model of come in and round and then go to your office, we were very fearful about shifting into a hospitalist model. Um, for all the things Shelby mentioned, loss of continuity. We were worried outcomes were gonna get worse because people just don't know our patients, you know, as, as Ed mentioned, um, and that it would accelerate the disconnection of uh, our community MDs from the hospital. The last piece, it's too early to tell, but the great thing from Shelby's work is it's reassured us on those first two pieces. So it really speaks to the value of local research answering local questions, and it was great to see. Is the, did you look at the economic implications for the family physicians. I think historically that's been one of the explanations for this shift mm -hmm. that with, you know, with hospitals is harder to get people into the hospital and uh, people's panel sizes are smaller. So it's, it over time has become less and less economic for family doctors to maintain inpatient privileges at hospitals. So do you know, did you have a, a look at that at all? I can comment on that briefly. So um, there, and there's been other studies, there's lots of different ways to do this. So like studies have looked at kind of going head to head patients admitted with pneumonia, like how are the costs to the hospital family doc rounding on their own patient versus hospitalist in terms of like the antibiotics that are used, the imaging that's um, ordered, the, the change in the length of stay and the cost associated with that. Um, due to kind of the short like nine month timeline for my project, I was unable to do kind of that thorough in-depth analysis, but we did look at the cost associated to the hospital in kind of remuneration um, in terms of community family docs coming into round each morning and then coverage on the weekend versus the hospitalist model um, and how directly out of our hospital budget, how the cost associated with paying the physicians through the various stipends and things changed. And the short answer is that the, the cost difference was very, very, very small going from model A to model B with that very limited analysis that was done um, compared to the two models. So not not a big change, but like kind of small peanuts, like on a scale of $100, $500, I think it was. Um, but that that kind of large scale kind of overview of the costs um, was not done. But that's something yes. that we could consider in the future. Shelby, I guess I, I'm more interested in the revenue for the physicians. Oh, okay. What, what difference does it yeah. make to the family doctor to participate in one model versus the other? Interesting question. Um, so I guess it would, it would depend. So like, for example, before there was this group of family physicians that would come in and round, there are other physicians in our community that don't choose to do that. And then some of the physicians that used to provide hospital care through model A didn't necessarily continue to provide care through model B. So we'd have to look at kind of the same ones that I surveyed who provided care in both models. Um, and I guess we would have to compare their OHIP billing and things like that. I would like to thank Shelby and all our speakers uh, from this morning. and Also, all our speakers for the past year. Um, we have heard some great research and scholarship from all corners of our department, from rural centers, urban, in the community. It's just been fabulous. Um, so thanks to everybody that presented and all of you for engaging in the conversations.